Welcome everyone. My name is Clotilde Redfern. I'm the director of the Rory Pack Trust. My colleague Leanne Dimitrenko heads up events at the Trust and she organizes events. She will be managing um, this webinar this evening. It's re a real pleasure um, to work with two, two wonderful people who I work very closely with at the Trust. Tira Schubert is, is the chair of the Board of Trustees. And we're very lucky that Clive Myrie joined the board of the Roy Pack Trust not, not long ago and has played a very active role in supporting our work. So if um, some of you are new to the trust, I just wanted to let you know that we've been running for 25 years and the Roy Pack Trust is dedicated to the support, safety and welfare of freelance news gatherers and journalists around the world. So, uh, our purpose is to provide practical and financial support to freelance journalists and their families worldwide, assisting them in times of crisis and helping them to work more safely and professionally. Over the pandemic, we have seen that concerns for journalists livelihoods has been huge. The pandemic has had a devastating effect. And as we all know, financial concerns often lead to um, psychological concerns. And there are, have been two intellect, in, intersect, um, intersecting issues that we've looked to support our network of journalists with. We, we launched a COVID-19 hardship fund, which gives financial assistance to journalists in need, of which there have been many through such a tough year for, for journalism and for, for the sector in general. But we were also told that non-financial support is crucially important as well. And we isolated two themes and two areas that people are really interested in. One is the business of, journal of freelance journalism, how you make it pay, how you manage it as a livelihood. And the other is, how do you stay resilient? The resilience and mental health issues. So these are two themes under which we have organized several webinars. And this is the second in our resilience um, theme of webinars. And I'm just really, really glad to have both Clive and Tira here this evening to talk about the challenges of working in hostile environments as a news journalist and how you manage to maintain your resilience, which Clive has a lot of experience um, with. So just to introduce them briefly, Clive Myrie has worked for the BBC for more than 30 years. And he's a trustee, as I mentioned, of the Roy Peck Trust. He was a foreign correspondent based in Tokyo, Los Angeles, Johannesburg, Singapore, Washington, Paris, and Brussels. He returned to London in 2010 to anchor BBC News programmes. He's won numerous awards, including this year's Royal Television Society Network Presenter of the Year and Television Journalist of the Year for his work at the BBC. He's also won twice at the, the Prix Bayeux War Correspondence Award and, and, and at the Emmys. So we have a real star here with us tonight. And I'm just so pleased, Clive, that you've taken the time to share your experiences with us and the Rory Peck Trust network of freelance journalists. Tira is a freelance journalist in her own right. She's the chair of the Rory Peck Trust and has worked as a news and documentary producer for British, Canadian and American television networks covering stories in over 50 countries. She's worked extensively in East Africa, the Middle East, Eastern and Central Europe, South Asia, the former USSR and Russia, as well as North and Central and South America. She co-authored the book, Lifting the Veil, Life in Revolutionary Iran, and has written for UK and US press. When she's not working from hostile environments, she's, in, she's very interested in space and she doubles up as a space reporter and is very excited about the upcoming Meteor Day on the 30th of June. Asteroid Day. <laughs> Asteroid Day. Don't worry. See, I, I still need to be educated about this stuff, but Tira teaches me about space science every day. Okay, so um, this right. event is gonna be uh, roughly a half hour, 40 minute conversation between Tira and Clive, after which Leanne will bring in any questions from the audience. Don't hesitate to tap in your questions in the chat field as and when they come up. When we get to the Q&A, Leanne will bring them in. So please let us know any questions you have, type them into the chat field. I'm gonna hand over to Tira now and switch my um, microphone on mute. Thank you very much, Katia, and welcome to everybody. 
Um, Clive, um, although I have known you for uh, about a quarter of a century, I think, I've sadly never worked with you on a story. Yeah. And um, yeah. so th I have that to look forward to. And as you've heard from a coach heel, Clive has reported from every continent on the world. Oh, except for Antarctica. Yeah. And has, uh, yes, I'm working that on that one. <laughs> you have that to look forward to. Watch yeah. out, penguins. And, um, and has an extraordinary amount of uh, experience to share with us. And uh, tonight, we're, I, 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 there's, I want to ask Clive about, um, there's any number of stories, but there's three different kinds of stories in particular that I thought would be uh, enlightening for us because they represent three different types of, of emotional and uh, difficulty and, um, and hostile environment difficulty. And so uh, briefly, I'll just say the first one is Clive's reporting from the Iraq war in 2003, when he worked with um, uh, Darren Conway, DC, um, uh, a tremendous um, cameraman shoot edit and well, more, uh, and was embedded and was in the middle of some serious, um, some serious fighting. So that's one kind of uh, one kind of story I want to ask him about. The second one, um, a, one that was three years ago, uh, covering Mexico's drug wars, where um, where Clive and, and uh, DC again were looking at at an internal conflict and looking at um, incredibly upsetting and uh, personal violence um, against 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 individuals and a society. And lastly, uh, some very powerful reporting that Clive and his team did in the largest hospital in the UK earlier this year about COVID and you were essentially embedded in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Each one of those I think um, created, uh, it was a different, different challenges and different emotional, uh, different emotional asks. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna start Clive by asking you about the first one, which was the more more conventional yeah. kind of uh, reporting, as we know, it was straight conflict reporting. And um, I want to ask you, um, of course, you did your hostile environment uh, uh, training beforehand, but in a story like that, in fact, in all of them, how do you start, how do you prepare yourself and how, how do you mentally prepare yourself and what are the kind of conversations you have with your colleagues or colleague before you go into the field in a fighting war? Yeah, Tira, thank you very much indeed. And also to Clotilde and Leanne and the uh, Rory Peck Trust. It's a fantastic organization and I'm, I'm really proud to be on the board. Uh, and hello to everyone who's joining us to listen into this. Um, yeah, three different scenarios of of conflict i suppose an emotional uh toll and as you say tira the first one iraq is is much more conventional um it, it's where you hope that you will see the enemy on the battlefield because there is a battlefield um uh as opposed to the killer that is covid19 or indeed some assassin hiding in some building in the middle of, of Mexico in a drug war. So much more conventional, much more straightforward. And yes, you do what you can physically. So <laughs> DC, the cameraman and I, we knew we were gonna be embedded with the Royal Marines and they're pretty fit people. So um, we did more time in the gym. We did a lot more training, that kind of thing, just to keep up with them physically. Um, and while we had hostile environment training from the BBC, we also had to go on uh, specific courses that the Marines were running. Um, certainly as far as uh, naval operations are concerned. So because we had to ship out, we were on, a, on HMS Ocean, which is the main troop carrier for the Royal Marines from um, Portsmouth to the Gulf. So we had that kind of naval training. But there was also um, a very basic marine training as well in terms of how to deal with the chemical attack and all that kind of stuff. So that's the physical aspect of how you prepare. Mentally, it certainly helped that DC is a really good friend of mine. And I hope that I'm a really good friend of his. We've known each other for many, many years uh, and reported from conflict zones around the world, Mozambique, Kosovo, Bosnia, and so on. And as a result, 
he knew how I worked. I know how he works. So there was an, intu an intuition there that, that meant that we could sort of second guess how we were going to sort of um, operate in a particularly stressful situation. Um, it helped that friendship being there, no question. It also meant that I knew that he had my back and he knew that I had his back um, if things got, got hairy. And it was interesting because the, the assignment editor uh, who called us up, uh, we were in, uh, both, both based in Singapore at the time, and he rang me up and he said, look, there's going to be this conflict in the Middle East, um, and uh, we've got an opportunity to be embedded with um, the Royal Marines. Um, now, it could be really boring. It could be incredibly exciting. But one thing we do know is that it's going to be incredibly dangerous. So it's totally up to you whether or not you want to get involved. And of course, being a journalist and, and, and you know, being someone who, who likes to get at the teeth of a story, you know, to be on the front line in the middle of a war with an active unit is, is, is heaven um, in a sort of weird kind of way. Um, and so he, he felt the same way too. And, and uh, yes, he is, uh, you are both um, the kind of people that want to be in the middle of things. But, yeah. but uh, what, uh, in, in, in 03, the kind of risk assessments, and um, by the way, our free resources on the website have a really good guide to risk assessment. Yeah. Um, the risk assessments that journalists did were not, uh, I mean, I, I remember, um, uh, not as thorough it as and, and as detailed um, as they as they are now. So, were you able to do a risk assessment that you were satisfied with? Well, um, not not really, because all we knew at the beginning of the embed process was that we were going to be with forty commando. Um, we didn't know exactly what they were going to do because they had not shared the battle plan with us. And that was basically because they didn't trust us. I mean, you know, we're a bunch of journalists and, and you know, the, the, the average Marine didn't really want us to be there. This was certainly in the first, in the first couple of weeks of us being on the, the troop carrier as we sailed out to, uh, to Bahrain from, from Portsmouth. And it was clear that there was a wariness. Various things happened in those first two weeks, which are too boring to get into, but we, got, we won their trust. And as a result of winning their trust, literally after various things happened on board that meant that they ended up trusting us, we were shown the entire battle plan for the war. This was as we headed out to um, Bahrain and before a single shot had been fired, we knew what the Royal Marines were gonna do. We knew the, where the Americans were gonna be. All that was in place, and we knew the obstacles potentially that were in the way of the Marines getting to their objective, which was to secure the second biggest city of Iraq, which was Basra in the south. Um, so knowing the battle plan was a real help to us because it sort of meant that psychologically we could sort of work out what we needed to report on, how we were going to gather it, where we were going to be. And it also meant, frankly, that we could tell our loved ones back home where we were going to be to a degree. Um, but obviously these were military secrets that we could not spill publicly. So although I knew everything that was going to happen, I certainly couldn't tell viewers at, at home. Um, and so I suppose that, that was the only risk assessment that we had, that we were with these guys who were trained. They're essentially going to look after us in, in I suppose, return for us reporting on how they are covering the war. And to a degree, it was an attempt for them to be able to tell their loved ones, the men and women who were supporting the troops who in the field back home in the UK, tell them that everything is okay. Tell them what is going on, you know, so that they're not left completely in the dark. And that was, that was a big part of our mission actually, yeah. just to inform the relatives of the soldiers back home, as well as inform the public of what was what, what what's going on. So pretty quickly after you arrived, you found yourself, and I do. Uh, I never knew you did training in the gym beforehand because um, mm -hmm. equipment was much heavier, cameras were much heavier, and I do remember you and DC throwing yourselves over impressively high um, fences and climbing, <laughs> climbing things, and uh, 
Yeah. Um, I, I, I still remember some of those scenes, but uh, you were, you found yourself in some serious shooting situations. I yeah. mean, in particular, uh, you were in the middle of uh, a, a night attack on, um, I believe, uh, some Iraq, uh, Iraqi officers' mm -hmm. barrack. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was very difficult um, to tell what was going to be happening. You're in the heat of the battle. Yeah. Um, when you're in this battle, the adrenaline takes over. What's it like after the shooting stops? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 look, look, it is, it is, there's a brilliant cameraman at ITN called John Steele. He wrote a book called um, uh, War Junkie. And there is an adrenaline rush that you, that you get um, in the middle of it all. And, and interestingly, while we were expecting the commanding officer, an amazing guy called um, uh, Colonel Gordon Messenger, while he was, while we were expecting him to say, no, you're not going to get into in the lead vehicle um, as we attack this bridge. We're not going to let you do that. You're going to be 10 vehicles back because we can keep you safe back there. Um, he was like, no, you want to be in the second vehicle behind the attacking vehicle that's firing weapons. No problem at all. He was totally open to that. And that was really quite incredible. And that was a rush, it has to be said. And once that's over... It is like being on a drug, I assume, never having taken drugs in my life. Um, you know, there is, you know, you, you, you come down and that, that adrenaline sort of, sort of dissipates. Um, I suppose it, it's, it's, it, it doesn't dissipate as quickly because you've got to get the story on air. So while everything has happened in front of you, you've got to write it, you've got to put it together, then you've got to send it, send it via satellite back to London. So that keeps you up as well. But, but yes, that, you, you hope that the adrenaline doesn't completely overtake you to the point where you do something really stupid. And, well, and, if, and that was something that, that we were really, really careful um, not to do. Once you started seeing, um, there, there was a lot of fighting between the different military forces that I remember you were involved in, but then also, then you started seeing civilians and then you started seeing the effect on civilians. and. Um, in a later report, and I wrote these words down, and this is from one of your more recent reports, and you're in Yemen, and you opened up that story with the, I thought it was beautifully written opening. This is a story about war. It's about um, war and its humiliations and the stripping of dignity, and uh, which I thought was a, a very apt way of, of opening a story on Yemen, but that would be a good way to open a story on any war because you saw that and you saw the effect on civilians. Mm, yeah, it's, it's funnily enough, interestingly, um, it's, it's not just civilians, it's those soldiers as well, because so many troops were captured by, a lot of them surrendered. Some were captured in firefights that, that we saw and we watched, but they were in flip-flops and plimsolls. You know, that was their, you know, that was the footwear they had. They weren't, didn't have proper boots. You know, they didn't have proper um, uh, helmets. Um, or, you know, their uniforms were sort of shoddy and moth-eaten and, and it was, you know, there was a real sense that this was an army that had been sent into battle to, to, to fight that, that just wasn't equipped, just wasn't ready. And there were, lots of them were young kids who didn't really know whether they were coming or going. That was tragic to see. Um, but yes, the majority of the fighting actually was out in the open or it was military installations. As you say, that, that nighttime attack was on a Ba'ath Party headquarters where we understood that Iraqi, uh, an Iraqi unit was holed up. Um, you know, there were sentry posts that the, the, the Marines attacked and there were vital bridges and roads that they needed to secure, which were being sort of, uh, which had been commandeered by the Iraqi army. So, so a lot of it was out in the open. It wasn't street to street. It wasn't hand to hand. But as we got into um, built up areas, you then saw civilians. And I suppose they were not part of, I mean, there were some areas where the Iraqis had sort of based themselves in a civilian population in order to use them as, as human shields. But by and large, these were just abandoned villages and abandoned towns that, um, that were away from the fighting. And we simply entered these towns, I suppose, to, as, as part of the liberating force. But what you saw was just intense poverty. What you saw were the results of 40, 50 years of misrule. 
of Saddam's misrule, you know, one of the richest oil producers in the world, where that so much of that revenue had just been squandered, had disappeared. And that was that was tragic because you knew the wealth that this country had, and yet so many people lived in abject poverty, um, which is which is a you know a classic story of poverty right around the world. Um, so it was it was the double the double whammy of a war on top of intense poverty that, that was really, really heartbreaking. And, and we tried to reflect in the reporting that, uh, that we put on air. And, at, and, and uh, at night after you filed or even on your way home, and I know you were traveling together, mm. was it important, uh, unlike many freelancers who are working on their own, yeah. was, did it make a difference that, that the two of you, as you say, knew each other well and were friends? And could and could discuss some of the more upsetting things. I mean, because you're going, we all, you know, we see bodies in war. We see, uh, you know, we see hospital scenes. Those are the kind of things that stay with you. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It it it, it helped that, that DC is 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 a good, really good friend of mine. And and if you're a freelance and you're in theaters of war like this and you're operating on your own, you know, you don't have that resource, someone to share you know, the, the fear with, the joys with, you know, the highs and the lows, someone who is by your side, who can take some of the burden. And I, I, my, my heart went out to those people who were there on their own. And, but nine times out of 10, if, 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 if I'm in, in, in some kind of situation that is, that is really difficult and you see someone who is operating on their own, you try and befriend them. You try and, you know, you try and make contact and give them the impression that there is someone else there in case something really bad happens. And that's really, really important. And we tried, we did try to do that. You don't yes. stay in your little bubble or you shouldn't stay in your little bubble because you're staff and you know you've got the resources of the BBC or, or Channel 4 or CBS or whatever. Um, you know, you try to sort of open up. And I think that's a really, really important thing to do. Well, now I'm going to um, uh, leap forward a few years. Another story that you did again with DC Darren Conway uh, three years ago, the Mexico, looking at one aspect of the Mexico drug wars and Mexico is sadly one of the most dangerous places for journalists to, to work. And that has a lot to do with the narco lords. The narco lords. Um, uh, we are, uh, 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 we sadly are always watching the toll that the difficult, these kind of stories take on journalists. Mm -hmm. Now you were in Acapulco, which um, um, at one point was this fabulous resort. I mean, it yeah. still is a beautiful place, but uh, what was very different about this kind of story was that you concentrated, it was very personalized look at, you, you looked at the drug war through personalities. Mm -hmm. And so th the viewer, became very attached to some of the some of the people that you were following yeah. and in particular and I would uh, say that these reports can be found on YouTube and we would probably share links afterwards um, there was a couple who were paramedics uh, who no essentially they were body collectors mm. and they were a couple a man and a woman um, who had a child together and m there you followed them as they went around picking up bodies that were the victims of, um, of the drug conflict and mm. the drug trade. Mm. And the viewer uh, became very involved with these people. It was, you, you and DC did a beautiful job in introducing them to us. And so then we saw, the, we saw what was happening through their eyes and it became much more, it was much more personal and it was much more focused. How was it like for the two of you who spent a much longer time out there and with them? What kind of what kind of challenges did you have? Mm. I mean, this is a really interesting contrast to covering um, a sort of general war, where it's difficult to focus on an individual and and take the viewer through the story through the eyes of an individual, which 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 tends to uh, which is obviously much more personal and also probably more affecting because you can focus on, on one person's anguish or pain or joy in dealing with a difficult situation. And, and 
often that's what is much more painful for me, and I know for DC as well, as a reporter. If you're covering a war and it's a big battlefield, you're covering the war and it's a big battlefield. And yes, there are soldiers that are going to die and, and people are going to be injured and so on. There is an emotional um, connection that isn't quite there. Um, in Mexico, because it was essentially focused on Acapulco, um, you could pick an individual and tell the story of, of the drug wars through the eyes of those individuals. And as a result, as a journalist, you get closer to the story, which means you're more emotionally invested, which means it can affect you more deeply. And it's the same for the viewer as well. And, and um, our brilliant fixer, Anne Laurent, she found a paramedic couple married, trained to help people live. They turn up, do CPR, patch them up, get them to hospital, then they can be operated on. But nine times out of 10, these two people, their life-saving skills were useless because they turn up to the scene of a shooting and the person would already be dead. So they were effectively, as you say, became body collectors. They literally just collected bodies and, and people killed in the most horrific ways, um, which I don't need to go into, just watch the reports and you'll, and you'll see. And what was really interesting was that a facade is put up by these people that they can cope. They've got an international TV crew there and they want to show that they're dealing with this horrible drugs situation. And we're filming them for a period of about a week, night after night after night, going out, someone's got his throat slit. There's a, there is a torso there and the head is over there type thing pretty much every night and they go they collect the pieces and they, they ran out of body bags the, the, the morgue ran out of body bags it was so bad the week that we were there and they say yeah this is what we have to do it's life it, it, it pays the bills this is what we do sometimes we can save someone but by and large we're simply collecting body and we'd but how do you how do you yeah. in dc because there's a there was a dramatic uh, moment i still remember where you are in the morgue and it, the scene is, and there's, you are surrounded by bodies. It is really a nightmarish moment. Yeah. So, so you have these moments where you're seeing these just appalling things on the streets, mm. um, uh, standing in that morgue, and you are, we are seeing a sanitized version of it on your reports. Mm. Mm. You are going from there, and at at the end of your filming, whether it's all night or all day, and you're going back to your hotel. Okay, yeah. and yeah. and walking, and that's the difficult moment. Yeah. And I've uh, and you you go from that, yeah. And then you go back to the ho hotel, and you say, "Let's have a drink in the bar." You go to your mm -hmm. nice room, and mm -hmm. there's a nice mm -hmm. clean bed, and there's running water, and yeah. That transition is the difficult transition. Is I I certainly have struggled with it in the past. Yeah. How do you how do you get how do you live through that? But, but you see that that's the interesting thing, because I'm in the morgue. Um, the electricity goes off, so it's the, the, they're not frozen, the bodies, as it were, they're not kept cool, the stench is appalling, and they're piled up in body bags, you've got bodily fluids all over the floor, you're, you, you're, you're worried that you're going to slip over into this, um, you've, you've got a mask on, uh, you've got chewing gum that you've been chewing all day, you put it in the mask so that you're inhaling the fumes of the chewing gum and not the rotting bodies. Uh, and there are just bodies everywhere and uh, it, horrible. But the thing, Tiru, is they're dead. They're already dead. So their pain is over, whatever pain they had. And they're hopefully in another better place. What is emotionally disturbing for me are people who are alive and who are in pain. And that's the thing going back to the couple who are the, uh, the, the emergency workers. They put on a, a sense of sort of an armor for the camera, but we're filming with them all the time. And then after three days, she's preparing some food and her husband, and this is, we're filming in the at home. Her husband is, is sort of getting the plates together and they're preparing food for us as well. Lovely, lovely people. She sits down. 
and I say, you know, what do you think about your son being being living in this kind of atmosphere? And she says, it, it's just, it's you know, I, I can't think what's going through his head, um, this kind of stuff. And then she just breaks down, completely out of the blue. After three or four days of a, this is my job, this is what I do, she just completely broke down and said, I don't know if I can take any more. That's what makes me cry. I'm crying. Her husband is consoling her. DC is crying behind the camera. Um, that is what hits. It's, it's, when, it's when the pain is real and it's in front of you and it's happening to someone who's alive. That's what affects me. And that's what I will always remember now. Yes, we go back home and we go back to the hotel and, you know, you get a whiskey or a Mexican beer and you just you just think, my God, how do they how do they live with this pressure every single day? And that's that's what makes me well up. Um, okay. You know, you worry for the families of the people who've died because they've lost loved ones and there is a hole in their lives and they will be crying. But for me to see a dead body particularly, especially one that I'm not emotionally connected to, it's, it's a dead body. It's, it's, it's those people who are alive who are in pain. And that's what gets me. And that's what I, I, I remember. I'll, I'll never, briefly before you go on to the next question, I was again with DC. I was in East Timor. Um, there'd been an attack by the Indonesian forces on a village. A woman who was just completely in tears. She was wandering out of the village, totally disoriented, uh, disorientated, didn't know where she was, heavily pregnant, probably about eight months at least. Tears streaming down, husband dead, children dead, whole family dead, didn't know where to go. And we led her to um, the, the, the refugee camp where, where, where she could get sustenance and, and get help and shelter. And it's that that's the kind of image that stays with me and, and keeps me up at night from time to time. It's the living who are in trauma. Um, and I know it's the same for, for DC. And I, I, I suspect it's, 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 it's the same for a lot of those people who, who work in this industry and who do end up with PTSD, flashbacks, nightmares, and, and, and so on. It's the living pain that, that gets do, do you make a point at the end of at the end of a day that, like the one you've described, the, the, the several that you've described, do you make a point of discussing things with your colleagues? You, you it all, it sort of comes out in the edit room, if that yeah. makes sense. So if I'm with DC or, or you know, um, Nikki Millard or, you know, Fred Scott, these amazing camera people, David McElveen, if I'm with these guys and we're putting it together, we'll be crying in the edit because we'll see again, you know, the images and, and the pain and the loss. And I suppose there's a, there's a sort of cathartic um, element to that, which is helpful actually, because we're going through all the pictures and we're deciding which to put together and which to use, which we can use, which are too painful, which would be too much for an audience watching their TV or, or reading about it online. And a lot of emotion comes out in that process to be honest with you. Uh, and I know when we're gonna get onto this um, with the COVID reporting that, that myself, Sam Paranti, the producer and, and David McElveen, the cameraman, you know, there were moments when we would look back at the footage and we would all be, you know, we would all have moist eyes in the middle of the edit. And that is helpful actually, because it comes out at that point too. So the, the COVID coverage that you did, that of course, to do something as intense and um, emotionally uh, um, emotionally challenging as the week or two, I, I don't know how long you spent in, it was one of the large, largest hospitals in London, yeah. which had, I think it was eight floors of COVID patients mm -hmm. in, yeah. in, in the middle of the winter. Mm -hmm. And you obviously had the trust of the medical staff yeah. And you got to know, um, uh, you, you made a point of reaching out to the families of some of the patients, some of whom survived and some of whom didn't. Mm -hmm. So it was a long-term, over a period of, of, of days and weeks, yeah. emotional investment. So yeah. it was a different kind of emotional, emotional focus. And mm -hmm. uh, um, 
how and, and did you find that um, uh, there was a different level of challenging? How did you deal with that, and how did the team deal with that? Yeah, that that was that was draining, um, equally as draining, because you saw the pain of the relatives um, of those people who were in the hospital in the intensive care unit at the Royal London. Um, you know, it's it. You can see what they can't see, which is their loved one on um, a ventilator. And to all intents and purposes, they've still got brain function, their heart is still beating, but everything else is, is, is pretty much redundant. The breathing is being done by, by a machine. And um, a lot of the families, they choose not, they, they can get um, uh, Zoom calls with, with doctors and they can be shown pictures. A lot of families don't want to see that because it, it is horrific to see the tubes and the wires and, and all that kind of stuff. You see that and that is, that is heartbreaking. And you see the photographs that have been sent in by the families that are pasted up above the beds. And you see what these people were like when they were fit and healthy. And you see the comparison. And, and that, is, that is particularly heartbreaking. Um, but again, it's, it's, it, it's, it's the emotional toll of the people involved that ends up affecting you. So we interviewed the, this woman called Hannah, who runs the morgue. And in, in a crisis that has led to the biggest numbers of civilian deaths since the Second World War, you'd think someone might want to talk to whoever runs the morgue. But that never happens. And I suppose it was because, it was because we'd filmed in the morgue in Mexico. And I'd filmed in a morgue in, um, in uh, Arizona. Um, during the COVID crisis there, um, about six months earlier, during the US presidential election. And I thought, why aren't we seeing this in the UK? You never see this kind of stuff. And you see bodies and morgues in, in Mexico and Syria and Libya and Yemen and all these other places. And I thought, well, hang on a second. Tens of thousands of people have died in our own country, in our own backyard. And yet we don't see any of this. And actually, if you do see it, I wonder how that might affect the messaging in terms of wearing a mask, social distancing, getting your shit together in that regard. So I thought, you know what, let's go one more. And we, we went to the hospital and I, just, I was just waiting for them to say, no, we're not going to do that because we just don't do that in that country. You know, that's going to that's gonna happen in, I don't know, South Asia or whatever, or Italy. It's not going to happen here. And they said, yeah, we trust you. We know you're gonna do it sensitively, but also no one's ever asked us to film in the mall. No one's ever asked us to talk to the people who are at the, the sharpest of edges when it comes to this pandemic. Well, that's, that's a, why you never a, see it. It was weird. That is, so yes. it, it's incredible, isn't it? So I go there, Tira, I, and we interview Hannah. And again, you know, how do you deal with, you know, this conveyor belt of bodies? It's just day after day after day. And I said, well, it's not your fault. It's no one's fault. Because I knew beforehand when we spoke to her that she that she she was just concerned that they couldn't help the families enough because of social distancing, preparing funerals and all that. It was all very perfunctory for the families. And she, I knew she felt bad about that. And I so I wanted to reassure her. So as the camera is on, I say, it's not your fault. And she says, yeah, I know it's not my fault. I, I know, I know, I know that. And then she just breaks down. And it's just, and I'm crying. Davy's crying. Sam is crying. There are two other morgue attendants who are in tears. And that's what gets you. And that's what sort of sticks, sticks with you. Um, and, and it's that emotional toll that she's been going through for months. I mean, all through last summer, Eat Out to Help Out, right, which was this government scheme, for those who don't know, government scheme to encourage um, people to, to uh, fraternize restaurants again after the lockdown to in, um, boost the economy. So people were given cheap meals. to. Uh, she spent the whole of that summer, while everyone else was going eating out to help out and getting back to normal, about, she spent the whole of the summer worrying about the second wave. That's all she could think about. All she could think about was the conveyor belt of body after body after body. And she doesn't talk to her friends about it because who wants to talk about death, even though that's her job, she's a morgue yeah. attendant, doesn't talk to her husband about it, would you believe? Which I thought was incredible because she didn't want to bring him down. All this was bottled up for about a year and it all came out in front of our camera. 
so you're so it's very important and it's something that it's a psychological first aid and um yeah looking after ptsd and the resilience training it's all about not bottling it up not letting it bomb, be bomb getting up. it out absolutely absolutely right um and and you know sharing it as much as possible if 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 you can with someone who's trained or with someone who loves you um or with someone who you're close to um that it that that feels to me to be the best way to deal with it and it's how it's how i've dealt with with it over over the years so that's that is your advice for and even if you are working on your own to talk to somebody talk to somebody absolutely yeah. i mean you know the, the bbc has got a lot better um in dealing with this kind of thing and even before we went into the hospital it was made clear to us that you know there would be counseling if we needed it when we came out you know um if there were people we needed to talk to there's i mean all that is really good now it, it was, hasn't been always like that i have to say and you know there, there there are instances where it hasn't been as good as it should have been um but i found certainly most recently that that support is there um, i think that yeah it's more difficult yeah, obviously and of course the roy peck trust we advocate for that now not only did uh, but but then uh, again one more question before we're one more comment before we go to some questions um not only did you do these incredibly powerful reports that i i found i i could see that it could have been cathartic I cathartic for, for the morgue attendant and other and other uh, uh, medical staff that you interviewed. But then you got um, you had these online attacks about by oh. people who perhaps have very strong views that COVID perhaps was fake news. And yeah. uh, so so th <laughs> then you then, then you had another kind of um, another kind of difficulty to deal with. Yeah, but you know what? I mean, sort of. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm a peaceable man, and I'm, I'm not about to use four-letter, four-letter words, uh, curse words in, in this, in this, um, in this briefing, as it were. But, but you know, people like that who are willing to dismiss what they see in front of them in order to justify their own particular thoughts on something. They, they, they don't want to base an opinion on on facts or evidence. Um, you know, they have a mindset and they want to sort of stick with that mindset. And, and you know, there were people who were saying, oh, you know, you're hyping it all up. You know, there's, there's th those, those uh, hospitals, they're not full. You know, we've seen pictures of empty wards in other hospitals. It's all being hyped up, which was why, <laughs> actually, the next time I went into the Royal London, I got a nurse to count out on the fingers of her hand how many wards had COVID patients on them to point them out. And that was really important to me to get that across. And I'm not, I'm not sort of an evangelist for lockdowns. I'm just saying, this is the evidence, then make up your mind. Because a lot of the time, you're not getting all the evidence in order to make up your mind about whether or not it's worth it. Um, and I just felt it was important for people to see that side of it and to clock it. So yes, you know, there our were-, there, there were yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, our job is to just lay it out there. To you bear know, witness, to bear witness. Exactly. And I. And I will say, I just want to say that not all the stories that you've done are as a fraught and um, as intense as the ones you talked about. I know you've done some very positive stories. I remember your coverage of Obama's uh, in, uh, election and inauguration, mm -hmm. uh, where you were. It was a very happy story, and yeah. um, I, I have even I, I've certainly done a few. I remember being in South Africa when Nelson Mandela was released, you know, yeah, when people yeah. were dancing in the street. So yeah. there are some happy stories that we oh, do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, interestingly, those there were tears as well but from everyone around. Then, you know, I was at Morehouse College um, in Atlanta, which is sort of, you know, a historic black university. Spike Lee went there, Martin Luther King, Samuel L. Jackson, J Jackson you know, it, it is the sort of, you know, Harvard of the South or as it were, or, you know, the, the Oxbridge of of, of black America. And uh, I was in the main common room, uh, the main sort of auditorium, TVs everywhere, alumni, faculty, um, you know, uh, students, everyone there watching the election. And when it became clear that Obama had won, everyone broke down, everyone was in tears. And I tried to get this across in my reporting. Um, and, and an emotional toll as well, I suppose, uh, because of the history of, of Black America, 
leading to this moment. So very emotional, but emotional in, in a good way. <laughs> not the not the not the other way, which is which is great. Thank you, thank you very much. Now I I have seen various questions clocking up on the on, uh, um, and so I'm going to ask Leanne to um, uh, field some of these and throw them at you, Clive. No worries. Say so, well, yeah. There's some interesting ones there, so I'll, I'll just throw them out in a random order, really. Um, okay. I I thought just from what you were just talking about, it would be quite interesting to hear this one. Um, someone asked, "Do you get on the job or after the job counseling? Is post traumatic stress an issue, and do you get any kind of regular support to deal with it?" Yeah, I mean, as I say, the BBC um, has has uh, people who we can access um, after or even indeed before going into um, a potentially traumatic situation. And it's made clear that, you know, we don't have to go to these war zones or conflict uh, zones and so on. You know, it's totally a choice that's up to us. Um, and if we do decide to go in and we have issues and psychological problems, then that can be dealt with afterwards. Now, as I say, this is something that wasn't necessarily the, the, the case um, 10, 15 years ago. And, you know, colleagues of mine uh, have had trouble um, when it comes to PTSD and, and dealing with these situations uh, and are still feeling the effects of the Bosnia war, even, you know, going back, you know, 20 odd years. Um, so that level of support, I, I've always found to be there in my case. Uh, and I think it's the case for, for, for all BBC journalists. But if you're a freelance, it's going to be much more difficult and that obviously is where the Rory Peck Trust can can, can come in and, and, and help. Um, but yes, there, 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 there is a mechanism for access to those services that can help you if you're a journalist now. Yeah. I should just step in for a quick second to say that this September the Rory Peck Trust is launching a resilience program. So Clotilde, our director, has just typed it into the chat as well earlier, but uh, basically we will be opening a fund for journalists um, to be able to access some money to be able to uh, pay for any kind of support, uh, like psychological support or therapy, um, as well as actual, um, I think it's 100 journalists will be um, having free access to the Dart Center Europe's, I don't know the exact name of the course, but it's a traumatic, uh, dealing with traumatic uh, reporting kind of course, which should hopefully be something that's good for freelancers and and all of those in our network are free to um, take a look at our website in the next few weeks when we'll be basically giving more details so so do do stay tuned but I know it is yeah it can be difficult to get support um, the next question so um, do you keep in touch with people you meet or interview during your reporting or do you avoid it to protect yourself it's a really really good question um, uh, some people who want to stay in touch we try and stay in touch with Absolutely. Um, and, you know, there are others who, you know, who tell their story and, and they don't want any more, uh, any more sort of publicity, as it were. They don't, they don't want to keep going over it. But there are some who do want to keep talking. And, and yes, you know, you, 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 you do what is practicable um, in order to, to make it clear to them that you don't just breeze in, take their story and then run away that you know, there's an, an emotional investment that they give to you. And, and if they require it, then you should return that. It should be reciprocal. And, and I, you know, I know that that is something that, that, that the vast majority of my colleagues um, feel is very important. Um, and not just the, the, the reporters themselves, but also the camera operators, interestingly, who are seeing this stuff up close through a viewfinder. And the producers, who are often the ones who are the first point of contact with these people, um, who may be, you know, going through a particular trauma. So, yeah, if 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 an interviewee, you know, wants to stay in touch, we do what we can. Absolutely. Thank you. The next question is um, probably more for aimed at freelancers. Really, what's your advice for journalists who lack the resources and possibly the contacts to move into conflict areas, but want to cover these kinds of stories? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 difficult, obviously, um, if you don't have the backing of a big organization. But organizations like the Rory Peck Trust, that's what they're that's what they're for, you know. And you know, the the resources can be found with a Google search. 
um, if necessary. Um, and it's always worth talking to colleagues as well. You know, it may be that you're from some local um, paper uh, in the middle of, of Kashmir. Um, and you're not quite sure how you should go about trying to trying to report on the conflict there. There are other journalists who are going in as well. There are other newspapers, you know, there are other media outlets. Talk to your colleagues. Um, uh, try and get the best kind of um, advice on, on how to operate. And then see if it's possible to, you know, to, to talk to an organization like the Rory Peck Trust to try and get the help that you need. But never go in blind. Never think that you can handle these things on your own because nine times out of ten you can't. You need support and you need backing. Um, and it might you might feel that you could get in there on your own and get some amazing scoop and and you know whatever. But you need nine times out of ten you're going to need help. And it's important to be prepared before you embark on anything that could vaguely be dangerous. Yeah, that's right. Um, do you have any advice on how journalists can prepare in a post-conflict situation, for example, Northern Ireland, for dealing with the victims' stories and representing them? Ooh, um, I mean, I think you've got to you've got to honour the victims and honour their families. You know, you're telling their stories, and you don't. These are not your stories that you're that you have ownership of. They're other people's stories that they're lending to you. So you have a duty to treat them with respect um, and treat them the way you would want your own relatives to be treated in a particular situation if they have some kind of emotional trauma as a result of someone um, being lost for in, in their family or someone who's close to them. You know, and I think that's really important that you treat people with respect. And you don't just you do not give the impression that you just breeze in, take what they've got, take their hurt and their pain. And then just 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 bugger off, you know. You're 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 dealing with something that's really precious, people's lives and people's experiences, and you've got to treat that with with dignity. And and you know you you as as a as a reporter covering these stories, you try. That's what you try to do. That's the most important thing. You let them speak. You don't just take ten seconds, twelve seconds. You know the most juicy bit. You let them speak. You, you, you give it time to breathe. It's not just bam, bam, bam. And it's important, even if it means you're having to fight with the desk back, in, back at the base to say, look, I need an extra minute on this piece because I want to tell this story properly. You know, you, you should try to do that. And I think that the stories and the re reportage that sticks, tends to stick with me are the ones that don't feel hurried. They don't feel rushed. They feel as if you've treated your interviewee with some dignity and some respect. And I, I, that's really important. Can I, can I intervene in this? Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Catherine Johnson. I've, I'm the person who asked that question. Hi, Catherine. Can I intervene in that? I've, uh, I'm a journalist in Belfast. I've been a journalist in Belfast since 85. Martin O'Hagan uh, was my brand secretary. Lara McKay was my good friend. Right. Journalists who've, only two journalists have been killed in the UK. Yeah. Apart from that, I've seen quite a lot of distressing incidents and so on. And it concerns me the extent to which you can leave aside your own personal points of view and to, to what extent you can represent the victim's point of view. And my from my perspective, the victim's point of view is paramount. And uh, I just wondered what you thought and what you thought in particular. And I know you've, you've uh, reported on this, you're very well briefed on this. And I wondered what you thought in terms of the reconciliation process in the north of Ireland. Well, look, I mean, you know, I, I my day job is, is, you know, as a journalist for the BBC. So, you know, there's a level of, of, of impartiality that I that I need to, to stick to. But look, <laughs> any kind of reconciliation after a conflict is vital. It's important. It's the only way to move forward. And a lot of the time you need to acknowledge the sins of the past in order to be able to move forward. You need to understand the the hurt, the pain, the anger that comes from both sides um and th that was one of the that was one of the most brilliant things 
about Nelson Mandela, and, and Tira mentioned him a little bit earlier, is that you know his setting up of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, which which was an attempt to hear the hurts and the pain on both sides, you know that that was such a large scale effort to clear the air after 60, 70 years of apartheid, that it, it, it helps people to move on. I mean, there are still a lot of problems there, absolutely. But it helps people to move, to move on. And I totally agree with you, Catherine, in that the victim story is paramount. And we're, we're no longer, we can no longer be dispassionate journalists who just breeze into a story, this side did that, that side did that, put them together, and that's your piece. You know, you have to identify as a human being first before being a journalist. And I think the, the key is to marry the two together, the journalism and being a human being. And that takes the viewer or someone watching your piece or reading your article to the heart of the story and, and, and gives them a sense of what it must be like living on the Falls Road or, you know, being being uh, in, 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 in an H block or whatever. Do you, do, do you know what I mean? And I, 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 reconciliation is vital, it's important, and it's the only way, it seems to me, Northern Ireland can, can, can move, move forward. And you've got little fringes now, that fabric of, of unity, is just beginning to fray, just beginning to fracture. And the key is to, to try to make sure that those little, that little bit of thread that's coming away, that it doesn't become a huge, great tear. Um, but, you know, that, that's as much as I can say, really, to be I'm honest. I'm very, very grateful and fascinated by what you say, because I think that's the way forward. As journalists, we're impartial, but as journalists, we're also citizens. Yeah. We have yeah. to represent the feelings, the emotions, the loss of, of people. Yeah, absolutely. But, have, but at the same time, we do that with uh, due diligence. Yes. I'm really delighted to hear you say that. Thanks. Thank you so much. My pleasure. My Great pleasure. Yes, thank you. Well, I think that we're coming to, sadly, I know we have many other questions. Um, but, I, I, me. Uh, oh. Uh, sorry. I, 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 me. Okay. Yes. Okay. One more question. And then, and then this will be the last question, I'm afraid. Um, I can see it's it's Al Albert. I can't see your surname. Um, please yeah. go ahead, and then we will listen to your question. Okay. Well, I want to say thanks to Claire. Um, I'm Albert. Originally, I'm from Sierra Leone. I was in Sierra Leone during ten years ago, and also I was in, in Liberia during the war. In Sierra Liberia, reporting, working as a freelance journalist, cameraman, and everything. So I have several questions, but. Again, you have limited time. But again, um, for me, my concern is again, it is with most of these international journalists working with um, local journalists. They, they have all the support in terms of um, counseling, in terms of um, PDSD and all of those support. They will go on the ground, they work with the local journalists, mm -hmm. and then at the end of the day, they just fall out without no support for the local journalists. Mm -hmm. and, the local journalist is being left alone to, um, to strain. There is no counseling. They will come back. Some of them don't even uh, um, um, call back to check how the local journalist is doing on the field. It happened during the war in Sierra Leone. It happened during the, during, the Ebola, during the Ebola crisis. Most of them went down to Sierra Leone. They worked with the local journalist, whether as a fixer, whether as a cameraman or code. Then immediately they turned their back. They, 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 they came back to the studio. They never come. Um, and call on the journalists to check on them on, on, on their um, post-traumatic experience, what, what, what they, they've been through, what they are going through. Mm -hmm. And then again, uh, I think again, that's one. Two things are talking about support. When they are done in Africa, it's so difficult, even when you write letters for support in terms of, for me, throughout the war in Sierra Leone, there was no training. What I consider, I've never been through any counseling to nothing. Because with the, the, the government did not have money, even the, 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 all these agencies that we are working for, whether it was BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, some of them, they will use right. your, 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 your footage. And I really they, 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 they are not so concerned about you as a human being, they are concerned about your story. Immediately they work with you, whether they play as a fixer or not, 
the, 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 back in Europe or America or wherever. They forget about the local journalists. Yeah. Okay, Robert, I, I, I think, I think yeah. we, yes, we, we're going to let Clive answer because your audio okay, is very difficult to hear. But Albert okay. is asking about local journalists and the relationship yeah. of international um, reporters with that. And I will hand that to you, Clive. Yeah, yeah, Albert. Thank you for your for your question. Um, and you know, I, I covered the Ebola crisis in in in, uh, in Sierra Leone, and I covered the war in in Liberia. And as with so many other places around the world, you know, you need local expertise, and you will talk to, you will have and 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 work with a local fixer. You will work with a local producer who knows the stories. And and I can fully understand that there may be instances where an international crew breezes in. They will use a local fixer, um, pay them, I sincerely hope, leave, and then that's it. Um, my experience, certainly of correspondence that, that I know in the BBC and myself, is that we, we, we try not to do that. You know, while we will, while we will work with local people, um, you know, they will be, they will be uh, a, a, a help, a resource, you know, uh, someone um, or, or an organization that, that, that can help us put the best piece that we can together. But we will always try to stay in touch with them because we know that we may end up going back to that to that particular story. We know that we we may end up going back to that particular country, and it's important for us to keep those relations um, uh, on as good a level as possible. So we will pay the going rate when it comes to freelance fees, for instance. We will make sure if it's a conflict situation that we will bring with us um, uh, safety equipment gas masks, flat jackets, and so on. We will never, ever, well, certainly in my experience in the BBC, we will never put a local person or contact into a conflict area that we would not ourselves wish to be in. And we treat them as our own colleagues. And I hope that that's the case with other organizations. You're saying that in your experience that there have been problems with that. But, you know, I can't, I can't speak to that. I would like to say that from my experience, we try to, to treat local workers as well as we can um, and offer support if they require it. Um, that's all I can say really. So thank and you. And that's one of the question. reasons that the Broy Peck Trust was, was exactly. founded in the first place. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, and Albert and everybody uh, else that is listening, I think do have a look at the resources on the website for freelancers and also in our award ceremony, which will be um, in November, and it will be online if you can't attend. Um, uh, it, it's very much about honoring local reporters. We have one award, the Martin Adler Award, which is very much about local fixers, but all of the different uh, award categories are about just really good journalism, um, and which is in many cases, the journalists who actually live in the countries, it's, not necessarily international journalists that come from another another place, but this is what this is what the trust is all about. It's about supporting freelancers everywhere, no matter where they are. Some people um, uh, don't have access to resources. We will um, offer bursaries and training and all of the other all of the other uh, um, things that we have been discussing. So on that note, I think that uh, we've run, so, we run over time. Clive, thank you very much. It's been, um, it's, we, we've covered a lot and I know we could keep talking about this for a long time because there's excellent questions, but thank you very much, Clive. And thank you so much to the audience. Um, and to, uh, to everyone. It, it's, been, it's been a pleasure. Um, I'm going to give the last word to um, our, our, our director, Clotilde Redfern. I just want to echo the thanks. It was a really, really interesting conversation. Thanks for talking so openly, Clive, about what was tough and how hard it is to witness other people's trauma and carry that with you. As Leanne did mention, we, we know this is hard. And as you mentioned yourself, Clive, you need the support of a team and others that you know really well who have your back. Yeah. And that is often what's missing when you're a freelance journalist. And so we try and fill the gap. And uh, we are really pleased that we'll be launching a resilience program in September that will give freelance journalists access to the excellent Dart Center course called Trauma Aware Journalism. And it will also provide 
grants to cover trauma therapy for journalists that need it. So I'm really pleased that we're able to launch that um, in September. And I encourage you all to sign up to our newsletter if you want to know more about that and make sure not to miss it. Thank you so much. Okay. It was lovely Thank to you have you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you Tira, Cotilde. Thanks, Clive. Leanne, bye-bye. Bye.